the members who cannot participate in individual events. So welcome to the second day of the Ruben Virtual Data Academy. And today we're going to be talking about uh, how to access and how to work with images and also how to, uh, we, we will talk about general visualization of the data for, uh, for instance, for solar system data, which will uh, be the second part of the morning. Uh, just a quick reminder about the resources. Again, we have the Slack channel to um, sign up for communications in real time, but we also will use the Zoom chat. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, please uh, go to the tech support on Slack where you can sign up there. Uh, and each session has uh, uh, its own Slack channel. So if you have any questions or any comments or or you would like to maybe even propose a session for the breakouts, which what we usually have after two hours worth of presentations, you can certainly put it there. Um, you, Those of you who actually are joining for the first time, there's uh, some information about the kickoff uh, for the, uh, for the uh, data previews in general, and that's in the channel there. Um, and I think Jeff, as usual, puts the uh, um, link to the slides into the um, chat uh, box. So if you would be kind enough, Jeff, to do this so people can go and, and follow along. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, use community forum for uh, basically sharing information, or especially for asking questions and trying to resolve issues that you might have encountered. Uh, the Rubin Science Platform is this uh, link on lsst.data.cloud, and we encourage you to actually go to the Rubin Science Platform and try to follow the speaker and try to do what the presenter is doing on your own and uh, um, basically try to execute uh, the different parts. Today, we're going to have both presentations uh, associated with both notebooks and also with portal. Uh, in Rubin Science Platform. So those of you who are joining for the first time, uh, you probably, uh, you might know, but if you don't, we usually think of notebook to be a bit more advanced way to access Rubin data. This is where you can actually perform analysis using Python code and so on and so forth. You can still extract images and catalogs, but uh, uh, you, uh, if you are sort of really getting started, you might want to get going on the portal aspect of it. It's very, very nicely developed user interface with lots of bells and whistles um, to the point that I probably don't know all of them, far from that, uh, even though I use I work on it quite a bit. Um, but uh, you probably will learn a bit more about that from some of some more additional presentations later on today. So that's uh, that's the Rubin Science Platform. Um, for the documentation and resources, we have uh, the two separate uh, uh, locations, dp0-2.lsst.io uh, and dp0-3.lsst.io. So as I probably most of you know, but in the case if you don't, DP0.2 is a simulation of 300 square degrees of Rubin data that have been provided to uh, the Rubin uh, data management team by the Dark, Dark Energy Science Collaboration, eventually reprocessed. That contains galaxies, stars, um, supernovae, and so on and so forth, but no solar system objects. It contains images and catalogs and uh, you can work with that using a variety of tools, again, in DP0 uh, science, Rubin Science Platform using both uh, uh, notebooks and, and tutorial uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the portal aspect. DP0.3 is quite distinct. It is only catalogs and it contains only solar system objects. It does not contain any stars or any galaxies. So you work with those separately and uh, that's perfectly fine because in, of course on a long run, we'll have both uh, stars, galaxies and solar system objects in Rubin data. But for the time being, usually the two communities were uh, developing the uh, simulations are quite distinct. Um, all the notebooks that will be going reside in the uh, this location uh, at, on GitHub. And this is something that uh, if you want to follow through going on your own into the uh, into the specific location and specific tutorial, uh, you will need to extract one of those. And uh, you, in a minute, you will see a, 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 a way how to how to do this. And this is on this very last slide. And if I don't have it here, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. And there are also a couple of documents which basically talk about the uh, um, the uh, desk uh, uh, simulated sky survey, uh, but uh, you probably won't have an opportunity to actually look at those. 
Uh, Melissa asked me to also mention the fact that we actually stood up a users committee for Rubin Observatory. And it is a uh, committee that is actually designed to uh, collect feedback, solicit and collect feedback from you and share it with the uh, uh, with the Rubin uh, community science team, but ultimately uh, with the uh, Rubin operations director. And the idea there is that if you see anything that is not working or you would like some improvements, please do uh, send the feedback to the uh, via this Google form that is listed here. And again, uh, I assume that Jeff had given you the uh, uh, the link to the uh, uh, to the slides here. Um, and uh, uh, members of the committee are listed here on the bottom. And in fact, one of the members of the committee, Vincenzo Petreca, is uh, one of the presenters here. So uh, it, there is really a fairly nice uh, relationship between community science team and the users committee. So maybe I should stop here and ask if there are any questions or any clarifications that are needed. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly tell you about the agenda. We have four presentations today. Um, Christina Williams will start us with the uh, notebook uh, presentation on image display and manipulation of the DP0.2 data. And then that will be followed by Nandini Hazra, who's one of our delegate uh, members of the uh, organizing committee of this, and she will be talking about uh, viewing the host galaxy of a supernova. So notice that this is sort of a, a common theme running here that now, yesterday we talked primarily about catalogs, today we're sort of moving a bit more into the uh, into visualization of images, and also uh, movement of the near Earth, Earth objects, which is what Sarah Greenstreet will talk about after the, uh, after the short break. And then finally, uh, Fabio Ragosta, another one of our delegate uh, organizing committee members will talk about the uh, interactive catalog visualization. So this is a, an agenda for today. And uh, for those of you who actually have not had a chance to uh, to learn how to uh, get started on uh, on the uh, uh, on the notebook aspect, I do have a, a, a special slide that uh, Jeff kindly provided yesterday. And that slide is right here. And this is how to uh, get started. You go to the LSST uh, uh, Rubin Science Platform, and that's data.lsst.cloud. That's the first step. Again, this the, this particular slide is in the same slide deck that you probably can see. The second step is you basically open the notebook aspect in a terminal. They, then you perform those uh, commands. You click code for the uh, um, uh, for 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 this uh, um, for this particular one, and uh, then uh, in uh, this this slide is primarily for for the specific tutorial that uh, was presented uh, yesterday. But uh, I think that the process that the, the concept is is basically the same. You just the, the most important part is to, oh, to get. Sorry, sorry, Greg, you're not uh, sh sharing your screen, so we aren't seeing what you're doing. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for pointing this out. Good point. Yep. Great, great. Thank you. Okay. And so, I think today, actually, people won't need to um, use GitHub at all because all of the ones presented today are already preloaded in their notebooks, tutorial notebooks uh, folder. Good. Thanks, Jeff. That's right. We have to worry about only, I think, in one of the subsequent days when we are uh, downloading uh, Vincenzo Petreca's uh, uh, notebook. So, uh, so uh, I will, in that case, uh, just uh, go back and and share only my uh, my agenda for today. Okay, I'm assuming that you can see the agenda. I failed to put my second uh, uh, second uh, computer up. But at this point, we're at eight ten. So uh, please do let us know if there if you have any questions. But uh, if not, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll just go on with the agenda. Uh, we have Christina Williams, who will be as I mentioned earlier, talking about image display and manipulation and notebook. So go ahead, Christina. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, so my name is Christina Williams. I'm at Noir Lab, and today I'm gonna demonstrate how to retrieve images uh, on the Rubin Science Platform and how to manipulate them um, using some of the LSST pipeline tools. So let me just share my screen. Um, for people who want to follow along, I'm just gonna show how to get to the Rubin Science Platform. So we're gonna go to data.lsst.cloud and uh, I'm going to log in over here on the right side. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Um, yes. 
Okay, so, so I'm gonna log in. Um, hopefully if anyone has trouble with this, then there's some help that you can get from the other uh, community science team members that are online. All right, so we're gonna get to this landing page that you've seen before, and we're gonna go to the notebooks. And uh, we're gonna get a medium container because we're gonna start displaying some images. So we need sort of a larger uh, a amount of processing to be able to do that. And we're gonna use the recommended image of the Ruben Science Platform and we'll click start. And then the server is gonna start up. Um, so while it's apparently taking a long time to start up, I'm just gonna, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so, the images, uh, so today we're gonna look at images from, these are gonna be simulated images from the DP 0.2 simulation that Greg mentioned earlier. So yesterday we were looking a lot at catalogs uh, through the portal and the notebook, um, but the images are, are a great way to visualize data. Um, so, uh, but they are a little bit different than maybe you're used to. So we're gonna go through some of the key features of the uh, Ruben images. So if you get to your, uh, you know, your landing page on in the notebook aspect, um, we're going to open DP 0.2 tutorial 03A, which is called image display and manipulation. Um, all right. So actually, let me just um, make sure I don't go over time here. Okay. All right, so this notebook is gonna help to demonstrate how to retrieve images from the Rubin database and also how to manipulate them. And so two key features we're gonna go through are uh, the Butler, which is the LSST pipeline's mode of accessing image data sets from uh, in the Rubin science, science platform. Um, so we can also retrieve catalogs, but today we're just gonna demonstrate how to retrieve images using the Butler. Um, so we're also gonna, uh, demonstrate uh, the LSST pipeline uh, image visualization tool package called AFW Display. So AFW stands for Astronomical Framework. So um, we'll just so we're going to import some of those packages here. So I'll do that first. So we're going to import some basic plotting tools like Matplotlib and also some basic AstroPy packages like uh, things that can um, deal with world coordinate systems, WCS, and a few other visualization tools um, that I'll talk about in a minute. And then we're also going to load up uh, the AFW display package, which is the, like I said, the LSST science pipelines display package. And we're also going to import uh, the Butler, which is the, like I said, the um, mode by which we are going to retrieve images from the Rubin uh, database. Okay, so I'm going to define some uh, functions in the beginning. So these functions, you can just think of these as, as shortcuts for different processes that we're going to do several times throughout the notebook. So the first one is just a way to remove images uh, once we plot them because the images can be large, so we'll free up some space. We're going to define something called cutout coad. So this is the images that come out of the butler are quite large. So cutout allows us to plot smaller regions of them so they're a little bit more manageable. Um, so there's several types of images that come out of the Butler, and I will talk a little bit about those, but we're going to import two functions, one for coads and one for CalEx files, and I'll explain what those are in a minute, but we're going to have two different types of coad or cutout functions for that. Um, then uh, another thing that we'll, we were going to want to do during the course of this notebook is to create RGB images, which are sort of color composites that help to visualize not just uh, the spatial uh, distribution of light on the sky, but also the color information that you get from having multiple filters. So we're going to import a, a function to plot RGB images. Okay, so AFW display uh, has a lot of functionality that you can um, take advantage of. So one of uh, so one thing you can do is specify the back end. So the back end is just how you interface with the AFW display tools. So in this notebook, we're going to set the back end to be matplotlib. So this is sort of a um, sort of a more static but uh, repeatable method for making plots using AFW display. Some other options for the back end include using Firefly, which I think um, you saw a little bit about yesterday. And Firefly is more of an interactive uh, 
uh, image visualization tool. But today we're going to use Matplotlib, um, which hopefully some of you are familiar with. So we're also, in order to use Matplotlib, we're just going to set a few parameters up front that will make the make Matplotlib make aesthetic images for us. So I'm just going to set a few um, parameters up front so that those images come out good. So this, including the font size and the axis labels and things like that. All right, so uh, so let's get started with accessing the Rubin data. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is instantiate the Butler. So the Butler again is the tool by which you access and retrieve images from the Rubin Science Platform on the Rubin Science Platform from the Rubin database. Um, so we do that. Uh, we have to specify which data set we want to retrieve images from. So in this case, we're going to specify DP 0.2 because this, these are the, the simulated images that Greg mentioned from um, the simulation in the Rubin Science Platform. And uh, we have to also specify the collection. So that, um, don't worry too much about the collection. It's just a way of, of specifying which of the DP 0.2 data sets um, that are, are, have been processed are, are uploaded into the Rubin Science Platform. So, so we're going to instantiate the Butler, and this is going to enable us to have a pathway to the data, to the images in the, on the, in the database. All right, so now we need to be able to tell the Butler which image we want to retrieve. And so we do that by specifying data IDs, because each um, image in the Rubin's database has a, an ID associated with it. So we're going to start with uh, accessing Calex files. So Calex files, you can think of those as individual visits by the telescope on the sky on any given night in any given filter. Um, so these are individual exposures that ultimately go into the full co-added image later, but they're um, individual exposures that we're going to access um, from a single point in time. So to, to specify the data ID for Calex files, we have to specify a visit, which is the, the specific ID of the time a telescope visited a, a certain portion of the sky. And we're going to specify which detector we want the image from. So we've already picked out a specific visit and detector for you here. We're going to use visit uh, 192350 and detector 175. Um, the band here is specified uh, sort of for convenience, but each visit inherently is taken in a specific band, so you don't need to specify the band. But in any case, um, we're letting you know here that the band that is retrieved is this this specific visit was observed in the I band. Okay, so now we're going to tell the Butler to retrieve uh, this Calex file with this specific ID using the get function, um, and we're going to store that in this variable called Calex. So we're waiting a second for the Butler to retrieve this image. Okay. So now we have this Calex uh, variable. And so Calex is storing the Calex image along with a, a bunch of metadata associated with this Calex image from the sky. Um, and so I'm going to show you a little bit about how to navigate all of that metadata and what's stored there and how you can use it for your science. OK, so maybe I'll pause here to see if there's any questions about the Butler and or about the image type and how you specify it. But also feel free to interrupt me in the middle if you have questions. Um, okay, I don't see any questions. So, oh yeah, Bob. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Hi. I, uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, there must be many ways to find the image that you want uh, besides somehow magically knowing the data ID uh, number is yeah. that something we'll we'll talk about later yes you can retrieve so there are many ways to figure out what the data id parameters are for a specific region on the sky so um, i'm going to demonstrate how to do a query later that will uh based on ra and deck and that's probably more likely what people would want to do to identify the RA, <laughs> the uh the data id but um this was just a simple first example so yeah. yep perfect thanks okay great all right, so then I'll just move into uh, data data visualization. So we have this Calex file that the Butler has retrieved for us. And um, this section, I'm going to show how to visualize the image that you've retrieved from the Butler. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is test out this AFW display, uh, LS, this set of uh, this package called L AFW display from the LSST pipelines. 
So you're going to set up a figure in matplotlib the same way you normally do, um, plt.figure. And we're going to tell AFW display that we want to display to this uh, figure that we've defined. We're going to set some scale parameters. So these are um, scales that change the pixel scaling so that they you, you can see bright and faint objects simultaneously. And then we're going to tell uh, AFW display to plot the calyx file. Now the cal the cal sorry not file um, the calyx variable. So the calyx uh, type has, like I said, a bunch of metadata in it. So you need to tell the AFW display which sort of extension of this of this data product you want to plot. So in this case, we're going to say calyx.image, which is going to tell the AFW display to plot the on sky pixel values. So this is the image we took of on the sky. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. So you see all these nice little simulated galaxies and stars from uh, the simulated data. And you can see that the X and Y axes here are in pixel coordinates of uh, the Calyx image. Okay, um, so this is sort of a first go. Uh, there's other ways that you can plot these images. So. I'm going to, um, oh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, right. <laughs> just more information. OK, um, so uh, obviously, you don't always want to plot things in terms of pixel values. So you want to plot things in terms of RA and DEC. So I'm going to show how to retrieve the WCS information from these Calyx files that are also embedded in the metadata of, of what's retrieved by the butler. And I'm also going to demonstrate at the same time, not everybody wants to use um, AFW display. There, are, You can also access and plot using only matplotlib functions. And so this next cell that I'm going to show here is going to first retrieve the WCS information from the CalEx, and then it's going to use um, matplotlib functions to plot the image. And so the, maybe this may be more accessible or more familiar to people. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is retrieve uh, the WCS from the Calyx. So here you can do that using this get WCS function, um, and you can also add this get uh, fits metadata in on um, extension on it, which puts it in the right format to send it to this AstroPy WCS uh, function, so that you can then set the projection for your image in the WCS coordinates instead of the pixel coordinates using this uh, matplotlib function subplot. So in another thing we have to do is set the ex extent, define the extent of this image. So you can use the get bbox function to do that. So bbox is like the bounding box of your uh, of your image on sky. And so get using this get bbox function can find the, the bounding corners of, of your image to define this extent. And then you can send this to matplotlib's imshow function, which you might be more familiar with for visualizing astronomical images. So in this case, we have to fix calyx.image to become an array so that the matplotlib understands that it's um, a 2D array. Uh, so, so this is how you access the sort of raw 2D pixel values of, of the calyx. So I'm gonna run this and it's gonna take a second. But now you have uh, the image from the Calyx, and it's plotted in uh, right ascension and declination coordinates, which is something we wanted to do. And we did this entirely with uh, matplotlib. So that demonstrates how to do that. Um, I mentioned that the Calyx contains a lot of other useful information besides just the 2D pixel values on sky. One of the things that's contained in there is also a mask plane. And so uh, for any image on the sky, there's going to be problematic pixels from, for example, cosmic rays or bad pixels or pixels near the edge of the image. Um, and so it's useful to be able to access which pixel, some, some information about which pixels should, be, should not be used for science. So I'm gonna demonstrate how to extract that information from the Calyx file now. Um, so, we can first uh, run this. So this little cell is just gonna display some metadata information about the pixel, what we call the pixel mask or the mask plane. Um, and so what is plotted here is uh, the definitions of the pixel mask. And so the max, the, all of these flags tell you which, um, which, what information is stored per pixel uh, in terms of whether the pixel is bad, whether the pixel is a, affected by a cosmic ray, um, 
or whether the pixel is part of a detected source. So detected uh, will tell will say that this pixel is part of a, a, a real astronomical image and has been identified as a, a belonging to a source. Um, so this can be really useful information. So we're going to demonstrate how to make some plots uh, that visualize that. So here on this cell, uh, I'm going to replot now uh, again the Calyx image here, um, like we did before. But now I'm also going to plot next to it the mask, the pixel mask associated with it. So let me run this and you can then see. Um, uh, so in the definitions of the different pixel masks above, you could see that each type of pixel flag has a color associated with it. So when you visualize the pixel mask, that helps you to understand which pixels are which uh, in terms of being flagged. Um, so here I'm showing the same image that we showed before, the on-sky pixels. And then on the right, you see the pixel mask. And so the most obvious things to look at here are the blue pixels, which are identifying pixels as belonging to a detected source on sky. Um, and so this is sort of a, a first look at what the pixel mask information contains. So this can be very useful. Um, so in this cell now below, I'm going to just show, you can also visualize together both the astronomical image and the pixel mask on top because, you know, it's a little bit hard to sort of by eye translate from one pixel to the other. So we're going to show how to plot that using this calyx.masked image here. Okay, now here in this plot, you're seeing in the uh, in the background, you see the on-sky pixel values and plotted on top is the pixel mask. So now it's a little bit easier to see that, uh, you know, how many pixels around this astronomical source is associated with this astronomical source. Um, and in this particular case, there's not a ton of other types of bad pixels flagged. There's some red pixels flagged that are uh, flagged as bad, but... Um, so this kind of demonstrates some of the some of the information that comes along with your astronomical image when you retrieve images from the Butler. Uh, okay. So you can also specifically plot a certain type of pixel value. So in this in this one, we're just going to plot the detected, uh, where the detected pixels, and we're going to set again the color to uh, the default color is blue, but in this example, you can see how to sort of specify which color to use. And so again, this is plotting um, the pixel mask on top of the astronomical image. Okay, so um, so you can also access, you know, I, I showed some of the functionality of AFW display here, but there's a lot more contained in that package. So if you would like to see what other options there are for analysis tools inside AFW display, you can ask it to plot all of, print all of the methods to screen. So here are some of the other options that you can play around with. And, um, and there's some documentation on, on the LSSD pipeline documentation to help you understand what these things do and whether or not they can help you with your science. Uh, okay, so I think I'll pause here again, see if there's any questions about the stuff I just showed. But if you have questions, you can also ask at the end. Um, we can come back to any of these topics. All right, so maybe I'll just move on to extracting image cutouts. Um, so, okay, so we saw some images, those images are quite large of the, the individual Calyx files. And so um, it can be useful to just plot a subset of them. So we're gonna demonstrate how to do that. Um, so first we're gonna identify which region of the image we want to zoom in on. And we wanna zoom in on this region that's around these this pixel coordinate of um, X pixel you know, 2250 and Y pixel 700. So there are some functions using the WC WCS that we loaded in earlier from the Calyx file to help us understand what the RA and DEC are. So you can use pixel to sky to translate these pixel values into RA and DEC and put them into an RA and DEC format that the LSST pipelines understand. So we're gonna do that here. So this pixel value corresponds to these RA and DEC. And uh, so in, in order to do this uh, cutout, we defined these functions earlier that, I, that we loaded up in the beginning and I, I briefly explained them, but I didn't say what was in them. These are just gonna be sort of convenience functions to help us uh, 
lump all of these operations together to make a little cutout. So you can go back and revisit the contents of the function later. But basically, this function is going to take the RA and deck and uh, the data ID and then um, tell the butler to retrieve this image. And then it's going to crop the image so that we can plot it. And that cropped image is going to be contained in this my cutout calexp. Uh, so first, let me uh, reload the visit in the detector. And I'm going to do the uh, cutout calexp. And then we're going to plot the cutout calyx again, uh, picking the image, uh, the image part of the the metadata contained in the my cutout calyx. Okay, so this zooms in on one region of that previous calyx. Um, okay, so since that took up a lot of space, I'm going to delete these. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about deep coad image types. So the the what we were talking about before calyx are just individual exposures on an, at an individual period of time um, on a single night in a single filter. But over the course of the LSST survey, uh, those individual exposures on sky will be co-added into what we call a deep coad image. So that's going to be the sort of ultimate sum of all of the images taken over the lifetime of the survey um, or up until whatever period of time during the survey where we're, um, the survey will take 10 years. So maybe you want to look at a deep co-ad at like year five and see uh, see what's been obtained so far. So these deep co-ads are really useful because they go much deeper and you can sort of see all of the fainter objects. So the data IDs for the deep co-ads are a little bit different. Uh, so the full LSST combined deep coad image is going to cover the whole sky, but we want to retrieve small fractions of, of the data that are more sort of human readable. So uh, the full LSST image is divided into tracts, and those tracts are further subdivided into what we call patches. And that's sort of a more like a smaller chunk that's easier to retrieve and, and work with. So in order to identify a unique region of the deep coad image, we have to identify the tract and the patch. And then we also have to specify the band because there will be deep coads made in every filter that LSST has. So just for convenience, we're again specifying the patch and tract for you along with the filter that we want to retrieve. And we're going to tell the butler to please get this uh, deep coad at from this patch and tract and filter. So we're retrieving that. And then like we did with the Calyx, we're going to display this using AFW display, uh, again, pulling out the image extension of the coad image. And so this particular patch and tract is a very nice one because it's uh, it's overlapping this uh, nice galaxy cluster in the lower right. So so we picked that intentionally um, because of the cluster. OK, so you can also pick out the WCS from this uh, deep coad. And then again, you can sort of find an RA and deck of a specific pixel area. Uh, OK. Um, so now that we did, uh, we pulled out this um, deep coad, we're going to plot a subset of that deep coad. Um, so, oh, actually here you can, if you need to revisit what's in these predefined functions that we defined above. So here we're going to just print out the various parameters for the deep, the cutout coad function that we're going to use here. So you can see what, what is needed. So for the cutout coad, we need to specify the RA and DEC, the filter, um, and give it the but the Butler uh, instance that we've created, uh, and also the filter, the band, and then the data set um, type, which is we're going to be calling deep coad, uh, a deep coad image. All right, so let's make our cutout image. So we're going to give it a 500 pixel size here. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, so we have this pixel, this cutout with 500 by 500 pixels, and then we're going to plot the, the cutout here. Whoops, sorry. Um, and so here is the cutout from the deep coad that zooms in on part of the galaxy cluster. So that's very nice. Um, all right. So uh, next, I'm just going to demonstrate. Um, okay, I'm running out of time. All right. So I'm going to run through a couple of other interesting things that are useful to be able to do. So, um, so here we're going to plot uh, some catalog sources on top of the images. So the catalog, oh, here, there's a chat question in the chat. Um, where can we find the data set types that are available? Um, so in the, um, let's see. Jeff, do you know the answer to this question? Is, is there a place that has, contains all of the data set types that are available in the Butler? 
So um, this is this is not ideal for the shared Butler that we're using because it it'll show you every data set type that has ever been registered. But if you in a cell, if you said um, Butler dot registry dot query data set types. It will give you a list of all the data set types, but it'll be like 10,000 data set types or something because it's everything that's ever been defined by anyone on the project in this particular Butler instance. But um, uh, it's you can still use that to find stuff, but um, otherwise, I think uh, we can put you to documentation. OK. Um... So I'm gonna, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to try to run through a couple of uh, interesting fun functionalities that might be useful to people. So um, one thing that that is useful is to overplot catalog sources on top of the images. So I'm going to demonstrate how to do that here. Um, so in order to, so first I'm just going to uh, in this cell sort of specify the the bounds, the image bounds of the cutout that we just created. So this is just grabbing the bounding box of the cutout and then um, defining the corners. And to, in order to find what sources are detected inside this, um, this um, cutout, we're going to instantiate the tap service. And you heard about the tap service yesterday, so you can query catalogs using the tap service. And uh, like Bob asked earlier, you can also use the tap service to query what patch and tract is the relevant one for a specific RA and deck on the sky. So uh, that that demonstration is sort of wrapped up in this query here. But we're going to use the tap service to query for objects on sky objects that are real astronomical sources that fall within the footprint we just defined uh, from this cutout. Uh, so and then in the process, we're going to also grab the patch and tract here uh, from this query. So that means that every RA and deck that you retrieve for objects that are within this polygon definition. So we're saying, please return everything that's within the polygon of this cutout. Um, send us the RA deck and also the patch and tract. And so this is how you can find the patch and tract to create your data ID later. So we're going to, um, although that's not the purpose of this uh, query, this query is just going to return objects that are detected inside our uh, cutout. So I'm going to run this query, and it's going to store the results in this uh, search result. The re sorry, it's going to store the search results in this table called results. Uh, so we can convert that into a more user-friendly uh, format called to by doing to table, and then you can see uh, the return from this query. It's uh, sort of truncated here because there's many sources inside the footprint, but uh, this you have some. Uh, object IDs, RAs, decks, pixel values, and also the patch and tract associated. And so you see, since we've started with a specific patch and tract, all of these objects have the same patch and tract that uh, gets returned. So in this cell, I'm just going to, we're just going to plot the RA and deck coordinates of those. Uh, well, actually, we're going to plot the pixel, <laughs> we're going to plot it in pixel values. But anyway, we have all of these sources and we know which X and Y pixels they reside in. So we're just going to plot those on top of our image here. And so here you can see uh, there are uh, pluses and circles around every um, detected source. Um, Jeff, were you raising your hand? No, sorry. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay. Um, one other thing to point out is that the the object catalog, which we queried to get all these RA and deck coordinates, those are a combination of any source that's detected in any of the filters. And here we're just plotting the I band. And so what that is. That means is that objects that are maybe not detected in I-band, but were detected in other filters are also included in this uh, list of, of real astronomical sources. Okay, so in my last, um, well, my negative two minutes left, I'm just gonna demonstrate that you can plot an RGB composite image. So you just uh, do the same thing with three different filters and you assign you know, the G, R, and I filter to be a, um, you know, a red, green, blue uh, color for the RGB. And then you can plot uh, RGB images in color, so you can visualize the color information in addition to just uh, you know pure fluxes on sky. Um, okay, so then, so I sort of uh, brushed through the last part very quickly because I ran out of time. But hopefully, if anyone has that, that at least introduced you to some things. So if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to elaborate on any of that. So yeah, that's it. If there are questions, I can take those.
I don't see any questions in the uh, Slack channel or in the chat, so I think that we're probably good. Okay. And I think that at this point, maybe it's a good opportunity for me to mention that we are going to have breakout sessions. So if you want to sort of, you know, go through some of those things in more detail, you will be able to do this. Bob, you you have a question. Yeah, just a real simple one. Are, do we currently limit the size of a cutout in that cutout call? Uh, no, I think you can. It, so the cutout call, I mean, it's it's just a function that was written by us. It's not part of the pipeline. Uh, but the the cutouts, I mean, you could just specify the cutout of the entire image package that gets sent back by the butler. I guess that would be the limit size. Um, but now that you mentioned that, uh, it is actually useful to have to be able to visualize parts of the sky that span different patches and tracts because uh, the patch and track boundaries are somewhat arbitrary with respect to you know astronomical objects. And so we do have a tutorial that we recently wrote uh, that will demonstrate how to join coads from different patches and tracts so that you can visualize regions across patch and track boundaries. Um, and that's uh, tutorial 3A or 3C, sorry. <laughs> Um, so that that demonstrates how to do that. Um, there's also we also have a cutout service, which this was just sort of a a quick way to retrieve the full image from the butler and then do the cutout yourself. But we do also have a service that will do the cutout uh, on the remote server side for you. Uh, and so those I think also don't have a limit, except it can't go larger than the the sort of basic image size of the Calex and deep coads, but um, you would spend a lot of time transferring data if you picked a large size. So, right. Thanks. All right. I don't see any more raised hands, so maybe we should thank Christina here. And uh, um, after stopping your sharing, I think Nandini is up next. Um, Go ahead, Nandini. Nandini will tell us about how to look for images in the uh, portal aspect of the Aruban Science Platform. Thanks, Greg. I have shared my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Thank you. So um, thank you, Christina, for that wonderful tutorial. And uh, now what we're going to do is try and look at images using the portal aspect and not the notebook, notebook aspect, which means that on this page, as you log into the RSP, you have to go here in portal rather than in notebooks like you did before. Uh, and what we're going to do as a jumping off point, we're going to use uh, the known coordinates of a supernova to go and query its host galaxy and to go and look at its host galaxy um, uh, in the portal. So uh, on top here, on the one of these tabs, so the tutorial I'm using is uh, this one. I will put it on the chat and I will also be putting it on the Slack later on so that you can have it. Um, so if you have troubles following me along, you can go refer to this tutorial right here, or you could also raise your hand and stop me and I will go slower if that helps. So in this, the portal aspect, you can query different layers of data. So the level that we want in which our interesting data resides, which includes the coads and the calexps and the different images, is basically layer three. So we are going to go and click on layer three right here in the portal. Um, please let me know if anyone is having trouble following along, and I will pause. So we're going to keep the data product type as image and the data product subtype as LSST, exactly what's written there, which is LSST deep coad dot calex, which is a deep coad of different exposure images with a small background subtracted. I will put that in the chat as well. So you can put that right there. Um, and then here in the name, so we already know the coordinates of, of a supernova. I'm going to put the coordinates in the chat right here. So we're going to go ahead and put those coordinates in here, just so. 
Uh, we're not going to choose any timing or spectral coverage, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and we're not going to change any of the columns that are selected. We'll just go with the default selection. And then we're going to go and search that and see what comes up. Um, this square, this is used, this portal aspect is used to query the data at this location that we have given uh, and to retrieve all the image products that are there in the deep coad Calyx player at that location. By default, the image centers at the center of the patch that patches and tracks are how the data set is divided up look in locations which is what Christina was telling us about. Uh, and this, these images are in different filters. So what we're going to do is right up here, we have this um, grid and we're going to click on that so that we can see all the different filters of images. Uh, and that's what it's showing us. Uh, it takes a bit of time to load all the images and it's going to have all the filters uh, right up here showing us what we, uh, the location that we queried. Um, one thing is that the filters are not ordered in UGRIZY order. Uh, they are in Y, Z, I, I, in a different order of images than we would expect. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and as soon as they show up, we're going to order them in UGRIZY because that's very, that's what we like to see. Um, we're going to use this hamburger icon. I really like that it's called the hamburger icon. Uh, right on top uh, at the left beside the Rubin icon and just click right there. And in the results layout, if we click there, we get to scroll down and use the tables and coverage image charts layout in order to visualize the images that we want to see. So right now it's in Y, Z, I, U, G, R order, but we want it to be in U, G, R order. So what we're going to do is click on this EM min column so that it orders according to the starting point of each filter. And we're going to go here in this tab called data product, IVOA, obscore, and click on that so that it shows us all the filters. And there we have it. So those are all our images. And now what we can do is use these tools, which are similar to the ones of DS9, to go ahead and play around with the images. But if you see, if I scroll on one, zoom on one, or pan on one, it doesn't pan on the others, which means they're not locked together. So what we're going to do is going to go ahead and use this icon right there called image alignment drop down. Click on that. Align and lock options. We're going to lock them by WCS. Oh, I don't know what I did to that one. Oh no. So the UN images disappeared. Oh well, let's go ahead. Um, what we want to do is we don't want to look at the center of the patch. We want to look at the supernova that we queried. So we are going to go ahead. Uh, maybe I zoomed out too far. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I don't know how to fix that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, do it again. So I'm just going to do the turn off and turn on version of this. And let's hope that this works. Sorry about that. This takes a while to load. Uh, meanwhile, we can talk about these tools that we have right on top here. Oh, that's not good. Oh, there, there we have it. So now we have the grid again and it's retrieving the image and I'm not gonna zoom out too far this time, hopefully. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go look at the supernova that we queried initially. So using the coordinates that I have put in the chat, 
We're going to go to this tool right here, which is called Image Center Drop Down Center Images, uh, which is the fourth from the right, and click on that. Um, thanks. Uh, oh, well, that's an image data plot fail. Did anyone else get an image data plot fail? Oh, well, that's not good. Um, Jeff, do you have any idea why that would be happening? I see a lot of uh, people are having image data plot fail. Yeah, I'm not not sure, but it looks like maybe as as if, you did, maybe reloading works okay. Just refreshing, it, does that work? It works. Yeah, it seems like that might might be the case. It looks like maybe we're we just overloaded things temporarily. Well, that's too many of us going on the portal. Can't be all of us going there right at once. Um, so I'm going to wait for you to refresh and try that again. And in the meantime, I'm just going to look at these tools that we have on top here and see what we can do with them. Um, so, oh, I should not have done that. Oh, well. Um, Right. So I'm going to wait for the images to load again because I did a boo boo there. So well, what we're going to do oh, is, sorry, sorry, Jeff. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say since since we were waiting for the images to load, um, I was going to add that um, Bob was asking earlier, you know, how do you know, um, like for example, what tract and patch correspond to with the coordinate you're interested in. And you, so you can see another way of figuring that out is just to go to the portal and remember Nandini queried by RA and deck position, but then you can see in the table on the left that it actually tells you which track and patch correspond to that position. So that's another way to find that quickly. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, you can see the track and patch right up here if you query by location. And I don't know what I did. So I'm just going to go ahead and join everyone in refreshing this again. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, I got the error too now. So we're all there together. And let's search again. Well, that seems to be working. I clicked on the EMN, that's right, Sarah. Thank you. How did I order the filters again? I clicked on this EMN right here. I'm doing it again so that it orders the filters. And I'm going to go ahead and close these older ones because I messed up there. And I'm going to go and click the grid so that I see all of them at the same time. And I promise I will not click anything weird this time. Um, so we're going to use the image center dropdown to re-enter the coordinates of the supernova that we want to be looking at. And that is going to bring us from the center of the patch to the actual location of the supernova that we want to be looking at. And once we are there, we're going to see um, the host galaxy that is sort of associated with the supernova. Uh, um, and we don't actually talk about how we associate supernova with their host galaxies because that's uh, too advanced for this tutorial. And I also don't know anything about supernovae, so I couldn't tell you much about that. But in this case, we picked a supernova that is very clearly associated with a galaxy that is close by to it. And so we get to see it right there, uh, just beside the event that we chose. Oh my God, image data plot fail. Oh my, that's not good. Let's see, no. Let's try again. And hopefully it does not fail this time. 
I think we are stressing out the portal by being too many of it, too many of us on, on the same service. Oh, that's it. There we have it. I'm not going to click anything weird this time. So we're going to go ahead to this square shape tool for align and the coordinates that I sent in the chat, we're going to go ahead and paste those coordinates here and do go and mark. And when we go and mark, we see that we are at the location of the transient. And what we can do is we can zoom in and have a view of it in all the filters. We can pan since our frames are locked together. Uh, there, we see our very wonderful supernova right here in G. Um, next, what we're going to do is just going to play around with the limits. Um, right now it's in linear scale, so I'm going to put it in Z scale log stretch. So that we see it as tidy differently. And then I'm going to go and do log stretch to 99%. And I am no longer connected to the server. That's not good. Oh, well, we'll get through it. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and use this color palette right here and change this to spectrum. Right here is that the location. Uh, my good friend Irene, who's the wizard with supernovae, says that this is probably due to the fact that this is a very recently exploded supernova, or that there are some non thermal interactions happening, which is causing this emission to become very blue. Uh, Sorry about that. And we are just going to do that once more. And you can see that, I hope that you can see that the host is associated very well with the supernova. The only drawback of this is that we kind of need to know where this event has happened, uh, but you will have those coordinates from the alert streams and we will know uh, where the supernova is happening. And so this is a good way to go and follow up in the data in which filters we see it. And that's where I'm going to stop and hopefully that will be the end of our technological woes. And please ask me if there is anything that you did not follow along with, or if you have any questions, if everything works, just let me know if that worked for all of you. I hope it did. I think there's just one question in the uh, chat. How did you uh, tell it to keep all six images locked together? So I think that was one step. Right. So I'm doing it here once again, because I forgot to do it. Um, so the second from the right icon, the one with the chain kind of, the chain link icon with image alignment drop down to determine how to align images. And then I just go ahead and align and lock by WCS. And that's what it does. Does that, did that work for you? Sorry, I'm going to go in. And that is our supernova host. And we're going to order the filters once again. That's it. That's the end of this tutorial. Tomorrow, I think Gloria is going to talk about, no. That's on Thursday. Thursday, Gloria is going to talk about how to generate uh, like curve of a supernova. 
and uh, she will explore the portal a little bit more. So you're going to go see some interesting things there. Um, are there any other questions? I'm going to check the Slack real quick. Nope. Yeah, so I, I will put up, okay, I will put up the tutorial link and the coordinates of the supernova in the Slack chat as well. So if you had any issues following along, um, you could go look at that later. Thank you. Right, thank you Nandini for a very nice and clear presentation. This is really pretty cool because it dovetails very nicely with um, Christina's presentation, how to extract images using two different aspects of the Rubin Science Portal. Yeah, the Rubin Science Platform. Okay, uh, we have a little bit of time now for a break. I imagine many of you probably would like to go and get your cup of coffee or take advantage of the break for, for other purposes. So we'll reconvene here again at 9.10 and we have a couple more presentations today. Um, but while you're taking your break, think about what kind of things you would like to have covered in our breakout sessions. And of course, there's all kinds of options. Maybe you would like to have a bit more uh, detailed description of uh, or, or discussion of what was presented in the morning in, the, in the, any of the four sessions. Maybe you would like to cover something in greater detail. Maybe you would like to to whatever you want to do. Just put it in a uh, in a Slack channel or in chat, and we'll pay attention to this. So uh, uh, I will uh, at this point I'll stop. Um, and and uh, unless anybody any other uh, organizing committee members have any any additional comments or suggestions. All right, if not, we'll see you at 9.10 Pacific time. Thanks.
All right, at least my clock is showing 9.10, so I think we're ready to resume. And I think our next presentation will be by uh, Sarah Greenstreet, and she will return us to the uh, DP0.3, which is the solar system object. So take it away, Sarah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Greg. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Greenstreet, and I uh, work at NORLAB, and I'm a member of the Ruben Community Science team. And today I'm going to walk us through one of the tutorial notebooks uh, for looking at the DP 0 0.3 uh, simulated solar system catalogs. Uh, and specifically, we're going to look at an introduction to near Earth objects and plotting some of their orbital parameters. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so since we've gone back and forth a bit between the notebook and the portal aspect of the Ruben Science Platform this morning. Um, we'll get us all back on the same uh, entry page for the Ruben Science Platform. Um, once you're logged in, then go ahead and click on the notebook aspect. Um, we're gonna choose a medium server uh, for this tutorial just to make sure that we uh, can plot all of the objects that we want to look at in this tutorial, and we'll go ahead and use the recommended weekly image as well. So we'll start up the server, which will hopefully just take a few seconds here. And then uh, once we get to the landing page, which will hopefully happen in just a second, uh, give us a little bit of time as people are trickling back in from the break as well while this gets started up. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do when you get to your landing page, uh, down at the bottom of the list of tutorial notebooks down here, we're gonna go all almost all the way to the bottom and we're choosing DP 0 0.3 notebook five, which is the near earth objects um, notebook. So, let me see, I am going to make that screen a little bit smaller for myself. Okay, so it's not blocking things. All right, so uh, this is DP 0 0.3 notebook five. Uh, we're gonna do kind of an introduction to exploring some of the orbital parameters of the near earth objects within the uh, DP 0 0.3 simulated solar system catalogs, which Jake Kurlander gave a very nice introduction to yesterday. Um, and so here, in order to talk about the near-Earth objects, uh, since we're diving into one of these specific um, topics, uh, we uh, let's talk a little bit about what the near-Earth objects are. And so near-Earth objects are uh, objects in the solar system that are defined to have perihelia, which is denoted by a little q, less than 1.3 AU, uh, where a perihelion distance is an object's closest distance to the sun along its orbit around the sun. So everything with a perihelion less than 1.3 AU is defined to be a near-Earth object. Um, we're also going to restrict the NEOs in our sample to things that have some major axes less than 4 AU, so that we're keeping the population of objects uh, relatively close to near-Earth space. And we're gonna bound our eccentricities to be less than one as well, so that we have only things that are bound to the solar system. Uh, often when we talk about the near Earth objects, um, we're gonna we're gonna look at the orbital properties of these objects. We're gonna talk about how to uh, plot the planet crossing regions and the boundaries for the planet crossing regions on uh, plots showing semi-major axis versus eccentricity. And that's also going to let us be able to look at the four different subpopulations of near-Earth objects as well, which are Amores, Apollos, Atens, and Atiras. So let's talk just very briefly, quick introduction to these four different uh, dynamical subclasses of near-Earth objects. So in this notebook, there is a written description uh, of the orbital parameters for these populations. But there's also this very nice little schematic diagram here which will uh, hopefully make it a little bit easier to talk about and understand these different populations of objects. So in this schematic, uh, the black uh, circle here is showing the orbit of the Earth, um, with the Earth as the blue, uh, big blue dot here. 
Um, and then we have our four different uh, types of near-Earth objects. So we'll start with the amours, which are shown in orange. Amours have orbits that are entirely exterior or outside the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and so they uh, are always farther away from the sun than the Earth is. Um, next, we have Apollos, which are shown in blue. These are Earth-crossing NEOs. You can see that this example crosses the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and they also have some major axes uh, greater than 1 AU. So they're Earth-crossing near-Earth objects that have orbits on average that are larger than the orbit of the Earth. Then we have the Atoms, which are shown in green here. These are also Earth-crossing near-Earth objects that uh, have some major axes less than 1 AU. So they're on average smaller orbits than the Earth's, but they're still on Earth-crossing orbits. And lastly, we have the Atiras, which are shown in red, which are kind of the corollary to the Amores. Atiras are completely interior to the orbit of the Earth, and so they are always closer to the sun <clears throat> excuse me, than the Earth is. So these are the four different types of near-Earth objects. We're going to uh, explore a little bit how to plot the, the bounding lines or curves uh, on SMA major axis versus eccentricity plot for each of these different populations. Okay, so in order to get started here, we're going to start with our notebook by importing some of the packages that we need to make these plots. So we only need a few here. We need NumPy and Matplotlib. Um, we're going to yeah, use pandas to look at some of the data tables. And then we also need the uh, LSST tap service here as well. So we're going to import all of those packages. Uh, and then we have a number of functions to define uh, in order to be able to extract and look at the orbital parameters for these near-Earth objects. So uh, first of all, the... Uh, MPC orb table, which is one of the four simulated solar system object catalogs within DP 0 0.3. Um, this has all of the orbital parameter information for these objects. Um, it, it only includes the uh, pericenter distance and the uh, eccentricity for an object. But in order to make a lot of the plots that we are going to do, we want to be able to have the semi-major axis as well. So using this uh, relationship between these three different parameters, we're going to define a function here to be able to calculate the semi-major axis um, so that we'll have it easily accessible for all of these near-Earth objects as well. Um, likewise, we're going to do the same for getting the aphelion distance of all of these objects using the pericenter and eccentricities. Uh, we're going to also uh, have a function here to get back the aphelion for all of these objects. Um, okay, so next we have two more two more functions here that are related to each other. These are needed in order to be able to plot these planet crossing curves in order to help define the boundaries for the four different subpopulations of near Earth objects that we'd like to be able to look at. So this first one is going to get the inner planet crossing boundary curve that uh, we need on a semi-major axis versus eccentricity plot. So we're going to define an array uh, that has a range from uh, for semi-major axis between 0 0.001 and the planet's pericenter. And then we're going to get the corresponding eccentricity values for those as well so that we have a semi-major axis eccentricity array that will allow us to be able to plot a curve based on an object's uh, a planet's pericenter. Uh, and then same thing for the outer boundary curve as well, using the object's aphelion for the planet. Okay, um, in order to uh, be able to actually plant, plot these curves, since we need the pericenter distance and the aphelion distance for these planets, we also need to define what the perihelion and aphelion are for each of the four terrestrial planets here. And we also have here our... our uh, boundary line for what defines near-Earth objects where we need a pericenter less than 1.3 AU as well. So we're going to define all of those parameters and then we're going to just uh, uh, put some plotting defaults on here in order to make the plots uh, nice to be able to look at. Okay, so now we can actually do our query for the DP 0.3 catalog in order to get the NEOs and all of their orbital parameters. So as we saw uh, this morning that Christina showed and uh, in some of the tutorials yesterday, um, we want to use the TAP service in order to be able to 
uh, access these catalogs. And specifically for solar system objects, we have a different TAP service, um, which is called SSO TAP, uh, compared to just TAP for the DP0.2 catalogs. So we're going to get the uh, solar system object TAP, and then we're going to do our query here in order to get the orbital parameter information for these objects. Where here, we're going to uh, limit things to perihelia less than 1.3 AU to make sure we only get the near-Earth objects. We're going to keep eccentricities less than 1 to have things bound to the solar system. And then we have some major axes uh, less than 4 AU to keep things in the near-Earth region. So then we're going to run our query. Uh, we're going to return back the SS object ID number, which is the unique LSST object ID number for uh, each of the solar system objects detected by LSST, as well as their minor planet center or MPC designations. And we want their eccentricities, paracenters, and inclinations. And we're going to limit them to these values that we defined up here above as well. So uh, this should only take a few seconds. Uh, and now we have our table um, of NEOs. We've also put the results from that query into a pandas data table that we've called unique NEOs here. Now, as I mentioned before, since the MPC orb table only has uh, paracenter and eccentricity, we'd really like to be able to add the summit major axes for all of these NEOs to our table to make it really easy to make all of our plots later here. So here we're going to use that uh, calc summit major axis function that we defined above to get the summit major axis for all these objects, and we're going to add it as a new column to our unique NEOs data table. Uh, and likewise, we're going to do the same thing for getting the aphelion distance for all of these objects, so their farthest distance from the sun along their orbits. And then we can print out our unique NEOs table here. We see that we have the SS object IDs, the MPC designations, eccentricities, paracenters, uh, which are in AU, inclinations in degrees, and then we've got our seven major axis and uh, aphelian distances that we've added here as well, as well, where both of these are in AU as well. Uh, and we've returned uh, just under 40,000 objects, um, which is how many NEOs with these specific parameters uh, are in the DP0.3 data set. All right, so now we have covered briefly uh, NEOs, um, some of their orbital parameters, these four different subpopulations of NEOs, and we now have, we've done our query, and we've pulled out all of the unique NEOs from uh, the DP0.3 DP catalogs. So now let's go ahead and uh, make some plots here. So first, we're just going to do a very simple scatter plot. Uh, of the semi-major axis versus eccentricities for all of these nearly 40,000 near-Earth objects in the DP0.3 simulated catalogs. Uh, so here you can see uh, I'm very used to looking at these type of plots, um, studying a lot of NEOs, uh, but you can see this very uh, telltale kind of almost V-shaped curve here for the near-Earth objects. This curve on the right here this is our uh, boundary line of a perihelion of 1.3 AU. So everything above and to the left of this line are the near-Earth objects, uh, and everything below and to the right are not near-Earth objects. So um, a scatter plot is somewhat nice to look at, but there's not a whole lot of um, information in here looking at just all of these objects together. So let's go ahead and uh, also be able to put the boundary curves on here for the edge of the NEO population and all of these planet crossing curves so that we can actually look at the four different subpopulations. So before we had these uh, functions that we defined before to get the planet crossing curves. So we're going to go ahead and run this to get these uh, arrays filled so that now we're just going to plot these planet crossing curves and we're going to label where these four different subpopulations of NEOs sit in this region. So here, now we aren't plotting any of the actual data points, but we've got these curves on here. Uh, so this black curve is the edge of the near-Earth object population. So this is the paracenter at 1.3 AU. Uh, and then the blue curves here are the boundary lines for 
earth crossing space. So everything between the rightmost curve and the leftmost blue curve, this is earth crossing space. So if you remember from before, Apollos and Atens are both earth crossing NEO subpopulations. Uh, for reference, the Earth sits down here at a semi-major axis of 1 AU and basically an eccentricity of zero. And we also have this vertical line at a semi-major axis of 1 AU. Uh, and then the Amores are on orbits exterior to the orbit of the Earth, and the Atiras are on orbits interior to the orbit of the Earth. So this is how you can get these different curves on here to be able to split up the different NEO subpopulations. So now we can also uh, split up our uh, NEOs that we've extracted from the DP0.3 catalog into these four different subpopulations, and then we can plot them separately. So let's go ahead and do another uh, plot down here. This is very similar to before, kind of combined the last two plots that we've made. But here we've separated out the four different subpopulations and made them each a different color. And you can see how they line up uh, with these curves that we plotted as well that help uh, mark the boundaries of each of these different populations. Okay, so uh, looking at this plot, uh, a scatter plot um, is useful for getting a general idea of what the uh, distribution of points looks like, but it's really hard to tell how many points might actually be piled up on top of each other in a figure like this when we just do a scatter plot. So to be able to better see the density of the points in this plot, we can make a two-dimensional histogram plot um, where we show the bins as hexagons with the colors representing the number of data points in each of those bins. So we can use a hex bin plot instead of uh, the scatter plot. Um, to be able to look at this uh, in a slightly different way. So let me go ahead and run this cell. Uh, and so here again, it's very similar plot to before, but now rather than just having all of the plots pointed on top of themselves without being able to tell how many points are there, we've got a color coding that helps to show the density of the points in different parts of some major axis versus eccentricity space. So the purple points is where there's not very many objects. You may have noticed before there are very few Atiras uh, in the population and in the, uh, the simulated catalog here. And then red uh, kind of along the line here, and especially in the Amores, this is where there's a lot of, uh, of NEOs piled up on top of each other in this part of the, um, of the phase space. Okay, so we're gonna scroll down here just a little bit farther so that I don't get too far behind time here. Um, another thing that we can do is rather than just looking at earth crossing space, we can actually look at planet crossing space for the other three terrestrial planets as well. So we can use the same functions that we used before to get the planet crossing curves for Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Uh, and then we can plot them on here as well. So. <clears throat> now I'm just showing the terrestrial planet crossing curves for each of the four terrestrial planets. So blue is still showing the Earth crossing region here. Everything between the two blue curves is an Earth crossing object. Uh, same thing for red is showing Mars crossing objects. So anything between the two red curves is Mars crossing. Yellow is showing Venus crossing and green is showing Mercury crossing as well. Um, let's see, I saw something in the in the chat. Uh, oh, good question, Bob. What families are Bennu and Apophis? Uh, I should probably know this off the top of my head. I I, I don't think I do actually know the, the populations off the top of my head. Um, okay, Melissa's here. She can check. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's keep going a little bit here. Uh, okay, so we've got the four terrestrial planet regions. We can now overplot uh, our different NEO populations here as well uh, with these different planet crossing curves. So if you're interested in knowing, um, uh, if we look at the Atens, for instance, here, um, they cross a number of different population, or sorry, a number of different planets, depending on uh, what the orbital parameters for any given Aten near Earth object is. Um, and so if you are curious about uh, 
which near-Earth objects cross which planets. This is one way to be able to, to visualize that. Uh, check the chat again. Okay, Bennu is an Apollo and Apophis is an Aten. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, so uh, we can also, rather than just looking at the four different subpopulations of near-Earth objects, we could just extract the planet crossing population. So if we wanted to just look at those objects, the near earth objects that cross the planet of Mercury, um, we could extract those separately as well. And then down here, we can make a four panel plot where we're gonna use this hex spin plot again to see the density of the points in some major axis versus eccentricity. And we'll do a four panel plot where we do uh, the planet crossing population for each of the four different terrestrial planets so that we can see how they kind of differ from each other. So top left are the Mercury crossing near Earth objects, top right is Venus crossing NEOs, bottom left Earth crossing, and bottom right are the Mars crossing, where you'll note that the Mars crossing objects don't actually go all the way out to the full outer boundary of the Mars crossing edge because of this black curve, which is the the boundary for near-Earth objects uh, overall. Okay, so I am getting close to the end of time. So let's see, I'm gonna go down here a little bit more. Okay, so one other uh, topic I wanted to cover briefly. So far, we've only talked about um, the semi-major axis and eccentricity distribution for these near-Earth objects. But another orbital parameter that's interesting to look at is also the orbital inclination, which is a measure of how tilted out of the plane of the solar system an object is. And so here, we're going to uh, make a two-panel plot here. On the bottom, we're going to keep the semi-major axis eccentricity scatter plot for our NEOs, but on the top, we're going to add in the semi-major axis versus inclination distribution as well. So the bottom plot looks very similar to the very first one that we plotted. And now on the top, we've got semi-major axis versus inclination here, where we're going up to 90 degrees, which is an inclination that's perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. Um, if you are curious about how the different uh, four different NEO subpopulations look in some major axis inclination space. We can also make this plot. Oh, that's the next plot. Sorry. Uh, first, <laughs> we'll do the, the hex spin plot again here. So it's the same example as before, where uh, you can just look at the, the over density of points here, um, which in inclination space, you can see that there's quite a bit of red here that goes in quite a wide range of some major axes here as well. Okay, so this plot down here, if you want to look at the different four different subpopulations and their inclination distribution as well, uh, as well as splitting them up in some major axis versus eccentricity space, we can also do that uh, as a function of their inclinations. There are no uh, boundaries on these four NEO subpopulations when it comes to inclination. So we don't have any curves or anything to put on here. You could still put the semi major axis equal to 1 AU line here, this vertical line if you wanted, which um, uh, will translate to this uh, semi major axis inclination space as well. Um, and you can see that there's quite a bit of overlap in the inclination between the two. Uh, populations on either side of the semi major axis equals one line. Okay, uh, let's see, scrolling down just a little bit more. Okay, so one final thing in my last minute or two. Um, so far, we've only looked at inclinations going up to 90 degrees, which is things that are perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. Most objects have some major axes less than 90 degrees, but it is possible for objects to have inclinations greater than 90 degrees between 90 and 180 degrees, uh, which would put them on retrograde orbits, which means that they're, when you project their motion down into the plane of the solar system, they're actually going backwards or opposite to everything else. And so here we can also make a plot of the extending the inclination range all the way up from zero to 180 degrees. Uh, and we'll put a line in the middle that will separate a horizontal line here that separates 
the prograde orbital motion, so in the direction of, of everything in the solar system, separated from the retrograde motion, so things that have high uh, inclinations. And you'll see there's only a handful of objects up here. Uh, and since there's only a small number of points here, we can actually extract these specific objects from uh, the unique NEOs data table that we have and actually look at their parameters and the uh, Minor Planet Center designations, the names for these objects too. Um, here we see there are six of these objects. Uh, one of them is uh, an actual known asteroid. This is a near-Earth asteroid that's known to be on uh, a high inclination orbit. It has an inclination of more than 154 degrees. There's also a simulated long period comet here, and there's four simulated interstellar objects from the DP0.3 catalogs here too. So since there's only six of these objects, our last plot here, we can actually make a plot of just these six objects. We'll just look at this retrograde inclination range, and we're actually going to label each of these objects with their NPC designations, so their object names, uh, near the semi-major axis and inclination for each of these points. So if I go ahead and run this, we can see here we've got semi-major axis versus inclination where we're only looking at this retrograde portion of the inclination range. Uh, and we notice that all four of these interstellar objects actually have semi-major axes less than one AU, interestingly. Uh, the long period comet is out here with the largest semi-major axis of the group. And then here's this known near-Earth asteroid that's on a retrograde orbit as well. So uh, this is one way to be able to look at some of the, the outliers in the DP0.3 data set when talking about near-Earth objects. Um, this is something that would also very likely be very interesting. One of the things I'll be interested in once we start getting uh, real LSST data flowing as well, one way to look at some of these uh, perhaps most interesting outliers in the population as well. So that is the end of my tutorial. And I saw a couple more chats in here as well. Um, thanks, Greg, for the note about the hex bin plots. Um, and yes, you're right. Uh, most of the MPC designations in the DP 0.3 catalog only have uh, the initial designation, so the year and the um, the alphanumeric code that goes with it. And if objects are named, like 2009HC82, as Sean points out, uh, has a number and it even has a name as well. So um, it is a very well-known uh, retrograde near-Earth asteroid as well. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, are there any other questions that I can answer? Sarah, I have a question that is really more about science more than, than the notebook itself. So what is the origin of the objects, the retrograde moving objects in the solar system? Are they captured from outside of solar system? Or, I mean, that it's, they seem to be sort of, you know, where in the world they come from? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. The, the interstellar objects here, these four ISOs in this uh, plot here, uh, these are, are things that are coming from outside of our solar system. So they're, they're just happen to be passing through and these can come from uh, any direction. So their inclinations we would expect should be pretty isotropic. Um, long period comets also are things that uh, come from far out in the solar system, Oort cloud comets, those kind of things, because the Oort cloud is a spherical distribution. They can also have all kinds of different inclinations. Um, and so uh, they can often come in on retrograde inclinations. This specific uh, near-Earth asteroid here, 2009 HC82, I think the two is missing here. Um, it is uh, something from my own science that I had looked at how you can get these things onto these retrograde inclinations. And we think that there's actually a way in the... Uh, the way that near-Earth asteroids come out of the main asteroid belt and get pushed into the near-Earth region where they can enter different types of resonances that can actually increase their inclinations and put them onto these type of orbits. So um, it's a very rare thing indeed and not something that we understand very well. Um, 
uh, and it's not an easy thing for asteroids to actually do. So they are some of the most interesting near-Earth objects in the population, certainly in my opinion. Thank you, thank you. All right, at this point, I think I see no other questions. Uh, so let me uh, just, let's all thank Sarah again. And uh, I think next up is Fabio, if you're uh, here. So thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm here. Yes, okay, Fabio, good to see you again. Okay, let me share screen. Hopefully you can see the notebook open. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Fabio Ragusta. I'm a fixed term researcher at the uh, uh, University of Naples, Federico II, and a DP0 delegate, uh, and also a TVS member and the, um, the um, and I'm also a member of the work, the Supernova Working Group, the coordinator of the Supernova Working Group. Today, I um, uh, just want to uh, show you some of the tools that uh, will allow you to interact uh, with the uh, with the catalogs uh, and specifically to uh, visualize a very large data set. The uh, Rubin Science Platform allows you to uh, use like three different uh, uh, tools uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, all of views, uh, bokeh and data shaded. Data shader. Uh, these three are, um, are packages that uh, allow you to um, to interact easily with very large data set. And uh, specifically, all of views um, interact with uh, uh, with li Python libraries uh, that are used to to make plots such as uh, Bokeh or uh, Plotly or Matplotlib. And we are going to see how all of views will allow you to do that. Uh, Bokeh is a, a, a library, a Python library uh, to uh, produce um, plots, uh, interactive plots. And Data Shader, um, we will see uh, that it's a powerful tool um, to, to handle a very high number of data. Uh, so when your catalog is full of millions of data. So first of all, uh, we are going to import all the needed packages. Uh, so uh, apologies to not mention that. Uh, this is uh, DP026B notebook. Hopefully all of you uh, are already um, there and allowed to and um, able to to, um, to import all the packages. If you have trouble, just stop me and uh, and ask me or ask anyone for help. So um, all these mod, all these uh, uh, functions uh, <clears throat> will allow you to uh, create interactive uh, um, interactive figures and allow you to make all the packages uh, interact uh, among them among themselves. So these are the versions uh, uh, available uh, on the R on the RSP. We will set just few options for the. Uh, for the displays of rows in uh, in Pandas uh, data frame, uh, this is the function that uh, will allow you to have the whole of you um, whole of you plots displayed with bokeh functions uh, or uh, the uh, matplotlib ones. So if you want to change the um, you know the uh, the library the, the the plot libraries. Uh, to interact with using holo views, you have to change here the name of the of the package, and you will see that uh, uh, what kind of package, what the libraries you are you are gonna use. Because uh, as an output, you will see the the logo of the of the library itself, and also uh, when you use the output notebooks from the uh, bokeh function, you will see what is the uh, library that. That you are gonna use you are gonna use when you plot the uh, the library because we are make make uh, different packages interact among them uh, we need uh, this two function to avoid um, uh, to avoid uh, a, a raising error the uh, the error that 
mm. that we uh, that we will see if we do not use this function is models uh, must be owned by only uh, a single um, document. This is because Bokeh use uh, a document object model to manage the uh, the, the wid widget and uh, the state of the plots. So everything is, a, uh, when we produce a, a, a plot, it's like we are using all the modules for one document. And we uh, and if we want to change and reuse that, uh, uh, that plot, um, that's create the, the raising error. So it's like we are using the same kind of models uh, in a different document. So to avoid that, we need to, to um to 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 run this uh this function so let's access uh, uh to the to the catalog via the top service because we are going to um to access a very high uh, very dense catalog we are going to use an asynchronous search uh within this coding center in, in this coding in, in, Centering its coordinates and uh, uh, within this radius. Um, the query, the in interpretation of the query is to select the, uh, the right deck object ID and the extendedness uh, and uh, the, um, the magnitude in G, R, and I named uh, with these, uh, these names. And uh, we are going also to constrain our search uh, with this constraint, with these options. So the text is primary. It means that there is no uh, sources from the blending. And we are just uh, going to, uh, to take uh, objects that are, um, that are uh, brighter than uh, 27. So let's run the query. This, this will take a few minutes. So if we um, if we want to use this time to see some some comments, let's say. If not, we are going just to to wait a little bit for the job to to complete. So the uh, this will just. Uh, Fetch all the results in the in a data frame, and uh, we can okay done. So let's have our, our data frame. Let's check if uh, the length the length of our data frame. So we expect to to collect uh, uh, one million three hundred forty five. Uh, thousand six seven hundred one objects so it's very dense catalog and uh, we are also uh, estimating colors and we are going to map the extendedness uh, value that we extracted from the catalog uh, to uh, the to point source or extended sources where uh, zero is a uh, is in, it's these the point lights are point light sources and one sent for the extended one. Uh, because the uh, the object ID is a numerical value, um, and we want to avoid problems, uh, uh, problem with the um, with the with the plotting libraries. We are going we need to change uh, the object ID uh, from numerical to strings. So that's going to check if we are right have if we have the right number of point like sources and extended one apparently yes. So uh, as a first exercise exercise we are going to take just the the two percent of our data and we are going to use this two percent that is tw uh, twenty thousand object to plot with hollow view. As you can see, with this option, uh, and later in the in the notebook, you will see that uh, hollow view allow you to, um, to set the options using options uh, 
um, function or just OPT, uh, OPTS. It, but the um, the functions that the, the keywords you are gonna define within options or OPTS are the same. So as you can see, I can shape, I can ex expand the uh, the the block uh, just using the uh, my mouse uh, and hovering my mouse over over it, but. Um, all of you, uh, all of you has all the um, uh, all the element. These elements function from over from all of you allow you to access all the possible plots, so scatter plots, but also the histograms. As I was saying, and to um to produce to produce the the the, um, the plots, you can either just run the function the 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 command, or you can save. Uh, the plot in a in a variable and then showing the the variable itself and also here in, in if we um uh, if we if we don't uh, set toolbar to none as you can see here a toolbar uh, appear uh, on the right um later in the in notebook we will see that the position of the tool of the toolbar can be decided uh, by the user Okay, so um, if we want to uh, have more plots side by side, um, all of you allow you to uh, to create this kind of uh, of view, just um, adding to different uh, to different plots, uh, and um, and having this view. However, if you do that, the the the, the plots are not linked. So if I uh, zoom. In a, in a region of uh, of uh, in a region of the uh, of a plot on the on the la uh, on the left, uh, the plot on the on the right um, is is not changed. However, if I wanna if I wanna link to uh, the um, if I wanna link to the two plots, uh, this is doable with the whole view, but to avoid having very um, non manageable uh, functions. Uh, we can define the plot style. So uh, in this case, I define the bokeh plot style. But if, this is an example of the um, you know, usual uh, usual keywords for a matplotlib. Um, so let's do let's create the scatter plot. Previously. Uh, we just defined uh, uh, the the data with uh, the, the scatter the scatter plot of just data without uh, referring to uh, actual. Uh, sorry if I go back and forth, but it just to uh, to show you the different uh, uh, features of this uh, of this uh, of this package. Uh, just uh, defining uh, the. Uh, the arrays, uh, they're just extracting the arrays from the uh, from the data frame uh, I want to plot. However, uh, we can also um, uh, in, inject the the entire data frame uh, in the um, in the whole of view uh, scatter plot and define the uh, dimension that are the axis that uh, uh, the axis of the of the plot, where k dimension is the Independent variable and b dimension is the uh, dependent y variable or x x, uh, x axis and y axis. We can also uh, you know uh, invert the axis and uh, label the the axis themselves uh, in the in the options uh, function of the scatter plot. So um, all of you give you the possibility also to um, sell, to uh, to have a selection of the uh, of a subset uh, um, of data of your um, uh, of your data set and indeed if you uh, if you select the range um, within which we, you want to define your uh, your your data set. Um, 
you can just uh, okay. uh, you can just uh, uh, define use this function to define the range and uh, uh, and define the label and the name in data set uh, this range has to be uh, connected to. So um, in this, once we define it, uh, the uh, color magnitude diagram, here we can, we can define the color color diagram. Oh, sorry, I did not run that. Okay. And, um, and here you see the color color diagram connected uh, with its histogram. And this way, if I zoom in the plot, also the uh, the joint plots uh, on the sides uh, changed uh, respectively. And I and I just do that uh, calling the uh, histogram uh, function uh, in from the uh, color color diagram variable. So before I have to uh, create a variable, a plot variable, and then I can call another plot, um, another plot uh, it, that uh, will create the, uh, the the two plots uh, at sides of the uh, of the in this case of the color color diagram. Uh, these can be done also uh, with the magic options. However, you can see that uh, uh, the magic option here um, just show every information you you have uh, from the uh, from the hover in the hovering uh, using the hovering tool. All the, uh, all the um, all the information you have in the data set for for the uh, for the plot for the the, the data uh, that you hover on. So if we over here, uh, however, if I wanna have a, a, a selection of the information I wanna uh, I wanna show, and it also if I wanna um, if I think of a, a form of a format uh, uh, in which I wanna I wanna show the information, I can use the hover tool, um, where a tool with um, that the, will define the all the information we are gonna show. Uh, we are going to show in this window when hovering over the data. Uh, so in this uh, list of, uh, of of two of a tuple, the the right uh, the left uh, the left element, uh, the first element of the of this tuple is the um, is the label that will appear in the window, and the right uh, the second element is the um, is the link to the um, uh, to the Keyword in the data in the data frame, and also the way you want to form uh, the format in which you want to show the um, uh, the way you want to show the, uh, the the information, and also how uh, you wanna uh, that um, the way you want to, you want to uh, make this information be shown. So overing following the mouse in this case. And here, indeed, we have just the information, the position, the magnitude, and the type. So let me. Okay. Uh, however, uh, before I I, I show it how to uh, to create joint plots, so plots that are linked uh, among among them. Uh, however. Uh, we also can create different plots that are connected. Uh, that are connected uh, among them. So um, in this, before 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 doing that, uh, we have to cre to create the uh, the data set uh, in the bokeh format, uh, following this uh, um, uh, this formalism and uh, uh, introduce uh, injecting the uh, the. A dictionary, a dictionary in the column data source, uh, 
uh, that will uh, transform your uh, your your data set uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, doc let's say document ob object uh, uh, model uh, I mean that will allow that will allow you to produce uh, the, the 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 plots using bokeh. You can also add uh, uh, other information, uh, uh, additional information to the uh, to the to the to the object to, to the bokeh object uh, in a second uh, um, later. So um, you can define a, a different kind of over tools uh, with respect to different kind of uh, uh, of, of plots you you want to refer to. So this is all uh, left. Uh, all uh, everything that is uh, labeled left uh, is for the left figure. Everything that is uh, uh, there is a uh, labeled right is for the right figure. And here you can see that uh, as you can see, I can create selections uh, in a plot. In the, in the left plot and uh, the right plot uh, will show the the um, the selection I, I made uh, in the in the color in the um, in the color mining mining to die. Also, uh, you you can also define the kind of selection you want to um, uh, you want to allow. You can you have the box selection selection or the lasso selection. So the box is just the square selection. Lasso is a, a polygonal selection. Uh, this uh, this kind of figures can also uh, be saved in uh, uh, HTML format, um, and you will have here uh, once you can you uh, you open you have to uh, push the trust. HTML button, and you have the same figure, same interactive figure. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so um, oh, we can also perform. Uh, uh, I just I'm just gonna show uh, very rapidly uh, these interesting uh, features of Holo uh, of Holo View uh, function that allow you also to um, to map uh, um, to map a function in uh, in the in the visualization so sorry i just so if i select a region in in the in the left plot in the right plot will appear the region i selected uh, and the function and the, uh, the the results of the function i defined in this case the mean of the uh, of the region um so very roughly, what data with uh, what data shade data shader does is uh, is taking all the things that we already defined. So all these fig all these uh, what I did sorry. I, um, Is me an error? Why? Oh, sorry. Maybe I did not run. Oh, indeed. Okay. So uh, if if I uh, um, if I plot the color color diagram using bokeh, uh, the over density regions, uh, uh, the over density region appear uh, very uh, very dim if I use the uh, alpha function to uh, to to uh, to highlight the over density region. However, if I if I use data shade data shader, I can avoid using the alpha. The alpha function, creating, uh, creating, let's say, uh, initializing uh, the box uh, regions, and uh, 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 
and this in initialization allow me to uh, ha to not having to not having the the uh, alpha function dimming the uh, the data, so I can zoom in as I like, and I also see uh, all the uh, different data within the region I uh, I select. Um, I think. Uh, and also uh, the selection, the, um, uh, the also the, the selection can be um, can be uh, in selection. I I show it the way the selection is made can be can be more interactive. As you can see, I can select different region and having the uh, correspondent histograms on the on the right and this is done uh, with the same formalism as before uh, but we use uh, when using uh, uh, the data shader uh, package I don't have to um, I don't have to think about the uh, um, the length of my of my data set I can have Million of data, and I can do the same thing that I do with Bokeh using Hall of View, uh, but using everything I have in the data set without having to reduce my uh, my within a subset, a subset. So, and with this, I finished. Uh, thank you, and um, apologies for running out of time. No, don't worry about it, Fabio. I, I after seeing this, I appreciate how many additional functions they didn't know about they still exist in, in terms of this uh, visualization so that was great all right we have plenty of time for uh, for questions and um then we're gonna take a, a short break but uh i would like for you to think about what would you like to learn about more extensively and we'll set up breakout rooms for that so uh uh any questions for fabio I don't see anything in the Slack channel for session session eight Tuesday, and let me see if there's anything in the chat here. Lots of lots of uh, accolades for Fabio. So great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so during the break, I will hang out here for a little bit, uh, just to make sure that if any of you would like to hear something more uh, described more extensively, uh, I will put this into the uh, um, into our list of the uh, of the breakout sessions. So let me just try to put the breakout sessions on the screen here. Uh, and, uh, share the screen in Zoom, and that would be roughly what we have. But please go ahead and and uh vote tell me what is it that you'd like to to hear about more extensively i think that's the session a for day two uh so one thing that is always good is for the main room we'll keep uh, that open for general question and answer sessions uh in the past we did the uh, uh basically self-organized uh, breakout room for new delegates for meet and greet um I know that there always is a question about what about light curves, what about time variable sources. So I'm willing to to do this in uh, one of the breakout sessions. Although I, that would be maybe not fair because that would preempt one of the presentations we're, that we're going to have on Thursday uh, for light curves uh, or two presentations on that day. Uh, I see something in a chat window. This is of of course this is last year's list. Uh, absolutely, this is a list that is not. Uh, up to date. This is just a, a suggestion from what worked last year. So, uh, so go ahead. Please do vote and uh, or do put something into chat. I see already few entries in the chat. So let me see. Uh, no. All right, so let's reconvene here maybe in five minutes at 10.15. And uh, we I will set up some breakout rooms and then we'll rename them depending on what you um what your what your interest is. All 
All right. So uh talk to you in at 1015.